Dr. Molly Marty and welcome to Resiliency Matters. Today we are speaking with Tim Fountain, who served as Colonel for Mental Health Engagement and the Mental Health Lead for the British Army for the past few years. Tim is also the recipient of World Makers 2022 Trailblazer Award. Welcome and congratulations, Tim. Thank you, Molly. It's a huge honor and uh, it's, a, it's brilliant to be with you here on what has been a most rainy day in UK. <laughs> Well, let's bring some sunshine. <laughs> uh, there's so much we could talk about. I could go on. You are an accomplished businessman. You're a certified meditation instructor. Uh, you have your personal experience with post-traumatic stress. Let's, let's start there to provide some context. So what would you like to share about your experience that really helped shape you and, and shape how you're helping others? Yeah, so it's really interesting, isn't it? So I think one assumes that just because you've been in the military that a lot of this comes from a military context, whereas actually, you know, a lot of mine came from growing up from a, a broken home, an adoptive family, uh, and that latent trauma, which really just um, sat there from an early age and then going to boarding school and then, you know, going straight from there into a military environment through Sandhurst uh, and then out into a, into a unit. So I think that, um, you know, there is this there is this really interesting thought process that everyone in the military is mad, bad and sad. You know, everyone has experienced untold trauma from their military days. And, you know, certainly in the British Army, it's less than one percent of people who you know, I've got PTSD from a, from a traumatic experience within that military environment. But what we're seeing is, like me, a, a resurgence in, you know, recognition of childhood trauma or developmental trauma um, as people go through their lives. And I think that that was one of the things that caught up with me as my glass started to fill and then overflowed in 2008 when um, effectively, you know, I, I had all the symptoms of, of, of post-traumatic stress. And, and you probably thought you were okay until you didn't. Uh, yeah. it, what, what was that process? How did you become more aware that you needed some help? Yeah, it's a really good question. And so at the time, I'd left, I'd left the military in 2008 uh, after a sort of near 20-year career. Uh, and I'd gone into the banking world in the city in London. And it was a completely new environment for me, something which I hadn't really sort of um, been around before. I was very much used to the sort of camaraderie, the sort of, um, uh, you know, the sort of definition of a military career. And I was doing sort of like 5.30 in the morning through till sort of 11 o'clock night days, commuting from my home in the country into London and then back again. And it got to a stage where my wife would um, uh, sort of sit on the stairs and, and sort of dread me coming through the door. Uh, and it would be that moment of if I come through and said, hi, how are you? You know, it would be like this, this instant relief that went over her face that I was actually OK. And then if I just start shouting, I just storm upstairs and just, you know, have that time. She knew that I, that was the time to be left alone. But I think that really came to head when my daughter just sort of said, look, you know, when am I going to get good daddy or bad daddy, you know, as they come through the door? Um, and then it was really a sort of, um, you know, a firm sort of, well, it's either me or you sort yourself out. And it was this um, awareness, as you as you say to it, that, that was really critical because, you know, in, in so many people, I'm sure you see this too, but there's so many people with post-traumatic stress or even, you know, in a depressive state or whatever it may be, um, they don't, you know, it's generally somebody else or a partner or a friend that recognizes those symptoms in, in the individual rather than the individual themselves. And so that was really the kicker for me to go, okay, yeah, this isn't right. This isn't, you know, this isn't as I should be. I need to go and do something about it, which then led me down the whole journey. And I'm absolutely adamant about this word journey of, of, of mental health. Um, of understanding of um, reading and research and, and it was really the the reason why I, you know I when I left school I, I was always told you will never go to university you know you will never become anyone uh, of any anything of any significance and it's very kind of you to say that I'm an accomplished businessman but I think I'm like most people but but it then led me down this road to um, being asked to go to Oxford University to do a master's in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which I've just finished. And I think that the 
understand, thank you. I think the understanding of that, the reason why that was important was because, you know, with knowledge, you can get that self-awareness. With that self-awareness, you can gain the influence. And with the influence, you can gain control over anything that happens with the mental health side. Um, and I was really interested, you know, when you interviewed Dave Richmond, that Dave sort of said the same thing, which is, you know, we can either own this journey or we can not own it and continue to be a victim along its along its um, along its uh, path. So that was, you know, that in a nutshell. Sorry, I waffled there probably. Yeah, so much good stuff, and uh, yeah, own own it or be owned by it, um, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so you have mentioned both PTSD as your clinical diagnosis, and you have referred to post traumatic stress. I know you and I share a philosophy of being judicious with with that label of a disorder um, and descriptively talk about um, you know, just the impacts of stress. Tell, tell us a bit more about your understanding and take on that. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? I think it was very easy from, you know, Vietnam area where this new thing of PTSD came around and the, you know, the research that led to um, that label for want of a better way of putting it. And I think that the, certainly the thing that I found with a lot of service personnel is if they're ill or if they're finding things trouble, they want a diagnosis. They need a label that they can hang their hat on. And very, it's very easy for the clinicians, and I'm not sort of um, having a go at clinicians, but it's very easy for clinicians to go, right, okay, you tick that box, you tick that box, you tick that box, you then have post-traumatic disorder. And my understanding of disorder is that's something that's going to be with you for life. And I think that through my journey of this self-awareness, this influence, this education, this learning, and through my mindful journey, that it really was... Um, you know, I was not going to be labelled with a disorder for the rest of my life. And if we look at the mental health continuum of healthy, reacting, injured and ill, you know, we often wait until we're at that ill stage. But if we can gain that education, that self-awareness, then actually we can come back down to that healthy stage. Or actually, if you are really in control of how you um, understanding the mind and how the mind works and what your tools and habits are and best practices, you can shoot through the other side um, to the left of healthy and actually be on this area of post-traumatic growth. So I'm actually feel as though now I'm in a much better place than I've ever been. So if I have a disorder, it just doesn't compute. I can, I can understand that I have post-traumatic stress, you know, as I moved up that scale or that mental health continuum. But as I've gained that, that awareness, that influence, that control, that education, I'm actually through the other side. So I don't feel as though disorder is a, is a right label to, to sort of have. And I think what we're seeing through, you know, the work of Amishi Jar, the work of Elizabeth Stanley, the work of, you know, various um, people, certainly within the mindfulness field, that, that actually we don't need to be defined by these labels. We can actually, um, you know, take control of that journey and own that journey um, and actually get to a place of post-traumatic growth. Mm. Yeah, and to the extent those labels are there, I, I think of you saying good dad, right? Like that's a label <laughs> that you want to claim, right? You, you can claim those pieces of that, that self-ideal and how you want to walk through the world. Yeah, yeah, and 100%. So when you became aware and, and were beginning this journey, there's a lot of stigma, there still is, we're chipping away at that, right? But um, what would you say to organizations that want to create that sense of safety that is needed? For someone to raise their hand and say, I need, I need help. Yeah, so I've seen a lot of different approaches over the years, but actually I think there's a consistent approach which works really well, which is that it's got to be top down and bottom up. You know, it's got to be, it's got to be driven. And we're seeing a a departure, not a complete departure, but we're seeing a departure from the old guard who very much refer, you know, don't understand mental health or mental health illnesses. Uh, and so therefore, it's easier to then say, man up, get on with it, you know, or, or we'll burn you out and we'll, we'll, we'll fire you off to, you know, we'll get somebody else to replace you. To people who are starting to have that own, you know, interestingly, some of the boardrooms that I've been in, and you talk to people at the start, and we don't know why we're doing this, but we've been told that we've got to do this. And then you, you sort of, there's a very simple exercise in, in, in the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy program, which starts off with a raisin. And do you know the raisin exercise? Yeah, I've done that, yes. 
and, and it's brilliant because everyone looks at it going, what on earth is this? And they're holding this raisin and you say it's an object. Don't think of it as a raisin object. You know, touch it, feel it, smell it, bite it, just... And it's about bringing attention and awareness to the present moment in a non-judgmental manner. Probably the first time that they've ever done this exercise. And the amount of lights that come on at the end of that going, well, you know, I live my life on autopilot. I'm rushing from here, I'm rushing there. Um, I'm, I don't taste the food that I actually have spent ages preparing. You know, I don't, I don't really interact and actively listen with the people that I speak to. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, great, I'm off. You know, how, how do we change the way that we operate on a daily basis? And I guess that, you know, that, that whole journey is, is, is fairly key and fairly critical in, in, in just bringing that awareness to people to say, look, you know, just take a pause on, on what you're doing at the moment and think about how you live on a daily basis. And then choose again and again and again, right? I, I was driving here uh, to the office time for this interview and it's color season in the Midwest in the US. And I, you know, my mind was already thinking of this conversation. I it got ahead of myself and I'm driving and then I just looked to the left and the, the hill was just blazing mm -hmm. with color. And I thought, no, I'm not gonna miss this. Like I am gonna be here. Uh, and yet with that practice, right, it, it's that continual choosing. Yeah. Tell a bit about your personal practice. And I, and I think we'll do a bit here and we'll pick it up on the other side, but really curious. Um, yeah, for sure. So um, I find it really difficult to get into mindfulness, really hard. Um, but there's one thing that Friedrich Nietzsche said, what you practice, you become. And this idea that if you practice mindfulness, you know, on a regular basis, it's a really key thing. So I like to get up really early. I like to do, you know, an hour, 45 minutes, an hour of mindfulness, and then follow that with some physical activity. And I find for me that just presses control out, delete on my brain, I mean, it allows me to just enjoy the day and sort of work from there on in. And I, and I really notice it when I don't do it. So that for me is a really good practice. Yeah. Yeah. I remember once when I was getting in trouble and um, I had, a, I was training MBSR and then I had a, a CD and I used to, you know, sit and practice it. I got to a point where I would hit play sometimes in the car and let it run and justify that was my meditation practice. <laughs> and so I got into trouble and then someone's like, well, are you meditating? I'm like, yeah, I have my CD playing in the car. <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I was called out rightly. So um, we need each other, right? To hold up those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We play games. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But the great thing about meditation, as we know, is that you can do it brushing your teeth, you can do it having a shower, you can do it walking, you can do it eating, you can do it in any way, shape, or form. You know, it's not the prescriptive stuff that everyone thinks that you sit down in a yoga position, a lotus position, and that's that's the only way to do it. And that's what I love about it. You know, you can get people on work sites doing it, you can get military people doing it. Anyone. Excellent. And we're going to talk more about this on the other side. Viewers, stay with us. Today, more than ever, you need fast, reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared and you can be certain we'll keep your world connected. I don't remember how it started. Oh, boy. Our back and forth. It always came back. You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. Welcome back to Resiliency Matters. Today we are speaking with Tim Bowden, who is the recipient of World Makers Trailblazer Award. Tim, this is presented to a Worldmaker partner for their innovation and outstanding service to the human resilience field, resulting in pathways for many. So first, congratulations. Thank you. Um, Huge honor. The Trailblazer is a, is a unique being. I, I think you have, you're leading with such a clear vision of the possibilities and where you want to go, and yet you're navigating and helping others 
uh, through you know step by step <laughs> the realities of today. Talk about that type of leadership. Do you know that <laughs> that's so true? And if I you know if I look at if I look at my journey and where I've been and where I've come from, and I look at the the, the education that I've gained over the years, the sort of 15, 16 years of working within this mental health field and and, and you know, latterly on the masters at, at Oxford with mindfulness, it's you do have now, I have now that clear vision of I need to, I need to introduce as many people as I can to what mindfulness can deliver. I need to introduce as many people to owning their own journeys and gaining self-awareness as to how they start that journey. I need to help people understand that you can't just go to a mental health lecture once a year in the army and that's you tick, you're going to be resilient in every way you go. You know, quoting Dave again, you know, when his interview is this bit by bit by bit, there are these building blocks as you go along, you know, in everything that you do in your self-awareness. And I absolutely accept that, you know, mindfulness is not for everyone, uh, you know, and it takes a while to get into it and it takes you know some time to sort of understand it but if you look at the tenets of you know mindfulness which is basically this whole idea of the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in a non-judgmental in the present moment you know if we look at what williams T, um, teasdale et al said said about it it is realizing that we can't change the past we cannot really influence the future we don't know what's going to happen but we can live in this present moment but also um, you know, help to enjoy this present moment of everything that's going on and, and all around us. And I guess that my mission or my vision is to, certainly within a military context, to help people understand trauma more, to help people live with trauma, to help um, not only the serving personnel, but also the family environment, you know, come together in an understanding you know, what um, people have been through. And I guess I saw that with the National Health Service when I was helping out during the pandemic. And, and we would go in and the trauma teams would come together and they'd be a different team every day sometimes. But they'd go through this whole day working together, seeing the most, you know, horrendous things and doing the most horrendous operations and trying to keep people alive. And then literally they'd walk out absolutely, uh, you know, you know, tired as hell. And then they'd go off and, and then go home. And that transference from everything that they'd taken in that day was being placed on a family who was probably already stressed with taking children to school, doing shopping, doing you know, everything else that they've got to do, probably working, in, you know, and in some cases working a lot harder. But, you know, that whole thing came to the fore with me and I just had a light bulb moment, which basically says, look, how, how do we help people speak the same language, to come together, to have understanding? How do we take those clinicians or soldiers or, or, or whoever is facing you know hardship and give them a moment where they can almost decompress what's going on in their lives at that moment and then move forward so looking how we did that or how i did that initially is when i was in post for this three years as, as colonel mental health engagement there was just a, pl a plethora of apps that were going out there everyone was making an app there's an app for this an app for that and that for everything else but I was finding that the governance and, and structure behind those apps just wasn't wasn't there. Uh, and so we were actually finding that people were doing things remotely and they were being triggered and then there was trauma and then there was all sorts of things. And so, um, you know, I, I sort of uh, joined up with a team from Leafyard and Leafyard is a they 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 sort of um, built this app around a cognitive, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy um, to help people with that resident outset. But the work that you do is absolutely crucial. And the world that stuff that World Maker does is, is absolutely crucial because there is no substitute from taking professionals, going on the ground and helping people, whatever situation they're in, wherever they are in the world, to take those that self-awareness and that 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 influence that you can give them by the tools and habits that you do with, you know, with World Maker and help them build that, that resilience over a longer term basis. And the reason I say all of that is because it doesn't matter if you're doing it through mindfulness. It doesn't matter if you're doing it face to face. But what we need to do is to really educate people on, you know, 
the ownership of taking a journey of the fact that there is help and tools and habits they can do to make their life better. In a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, this VUCA environment that we live in, which Amishi Jha talks about so well in, in her book, Peak Mind. And you know, if we understand that, then we can establish, establish a, a baseline of normalization. Because at the moment, no matter where we are and what we do, I think so many of us feel that our, our normalization, our baseline of norm, normal is just up in the air. If you look in the UK, with you know, we've just been told we've got a new prime minister for the however many time, you know, what's this going to be like? What's going to happen to interest rates? What are the markets going to do? You know, and that's the professionals to a normal family. They see that as raising electricity bills, not being able to live, not being able to turn on the heating. How do we educate these people and give them some form of normality, which they can then build the building blocks of resilience on and grow through that educational process? So I guess that's the passion. And we need people like you. We need people like your organization. We need, we need you know, a mindful approach to resilience to help in this uncertain world. There's so much, you know, I have a lot of favorite things about you, but some of my favorite things about you, Tim. I have been, uh, been in a conversation with you, whether around a, a board table or, or personal, where you don't bring it to the families, to the kids. We can be talking about military personnel or corporates or, and you, and you go, and family, right? The family needs help. Um, so, so that's coming through really clear. Um, you have this, this passion. We are living in this volatile, uncertain, complex, an ambiguous world and, and so much interference, so many influences, especially on our kids, um, that they're coming fast and furious. And so how do we manage those and eliminate what we can? But a lot of it's just going to be minimizing and managing, right? Yes. And then and another thread that you were bringing up here is, is you're a, a day one get guy or, you know, be, the day before day one, right? How do, as David Richmond says, get to the left uh, of the bang? And so um, how do we meet service personnel or people at, at HR coming into the organization day one? Um, how does that look where part of that onboarding is this resilience training and start some of these foundational building blocks? Um, and, and let's take it back to military. You know, your wheelhouse, not just day one, but supporting operators or uh, soldiers and then um, pre really preparing for the transition to vets so we're not in repair mode when, when people aren't supported to you know, world make uh, and recreate their world and, and then those families. So that holistic um, approach, all of those pieces um, were coming through you know, as you were sharing your passion. So talk, I, I, I like that idea about day one. Maybe it's like I said, because that's where my uh, heart is today. Why is this so important to get ahead of the curve on this? Yeah. Yeah, so so the day one approach, this journey, this journey from day one, whether you start it and you know the day you join the military and we start, you know, giving the training to those new recruits, whether it's you're in the commercial world and you have this epiphanal moment as I did, and your day one starts in your 30s, 40s, or 50s, whatever that may be, what can we put in place that enables that journey to start? And certainly what we found within the military context was was that we, we are hiring, for want of a better way of putting it, or well, the military is hiring, now I've left, but the, the military is hiring, you know, people from all diverse backgrounds, all, you know, from, from, from genders, from ethnicity, from, from, you know, complete diverse backgrounds. Some people are naturally resilient. You know, you, you take some people from some areas in the country, they've been brought up in a sort of poorer environment, they are naturally resilient at what they do. You, but other people, have never needed to know resilience in, in, in their lives to some degree, or haven't known that what they're experiencing is resilience in, the, in their lives as they go through it. And so it's really important because we know that from a neuroscience perspective that you know, something that we practice over a long period of time becomes a habit. You know, this neuroplasticity of the brain, which we never thought was there, which we now know is, you know, how do we ingrain those habits and tools that so we're not thinking about them necessarily, we're just doing them as we go on, whether that's a, an, you know, an attack in an enemy environment, 
whether that's making a, an important decision and just doing that stop, breathe, reflect and choose moment before you make that decision, whether it's an argument with a wife, partner, husband, you know, whatever it may be, you know, how do we just inbuild there that, that, that little bit that just goes, hold on a second, the mind takes over, we need to do this, and then we can sort of go along that path. And it doesn't matter what stage of your career, whether you're a soldier, whether you're a new officer, whether you're a, a major, a colonel, a general, whatever it is, um, we know that the, one of the hardest things in, in, in military life is this transition. Whether that's transition from a, a squadron, whether it's transition from a regiment, whether it's transition in your time out of the military. You know, and if we have that day one journey all the way through, we've got the tools that help you along the way so that when you do transition, be it through a um, something like Dave, where you were shot, um, you know, where you weren't expecting it, or be it at a time when you are expecting it, when you're pensionable or whatever, you have the tools that makes that transition not off a cliff, but down a gradual ramp into another second or secondary career. And I think that if we can arm people with the tools, if we can give them the tools that help them along the way, be it mindfulness, be it resilience training, be it you know more physical activity, whatever it may be, then we're not left with so many people that fall off a cliff that are at the right of that mental health continuum in the ill space, and they're therefore taking up a lot of the time, in our case of the National Health Service or the VA in your case or whatever it may be, you know, we can give them, we can give them that support, you know, throughout their whole career. And I think that that's, that's proving to have really good results here in UK. Uh, and I've been speaking to the American military about it as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think they're seeing those results as well by taking that approach and all the good work that you're doing to help with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to point out a couple of resources to our uh, listeners and viewers, because we mentioned David Richmond. Uh, there's a Resiliency Matters TV show uh, that's available on worldmakerinternational.org. We have several TV shows around adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, uh, where we started the conversation and everything in between. So th that's the, the references we've been making. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, as we're wrapping up here, Tim, what would you say to someone who is feeling despair and they come across this conversation. You've walked a lot of those journeys from someone from feeling broken uh, to, to feeling you know, more whole. Um, what are your final words to someone who's tuning in? The, the, final, the final words is you own, your own, you own your own journey, okay? There is a, the ability to get through it is absolutely there. Um, trust in your family, trust in those that are close to you, uh, find and get signposted to a good professional. Uh, and like everything in life, know that it takes time. Um, but over time, you will see the change, you will see the positivity around it, and you will come out a better person. Thank you. It takes time and you're worth it. Uh, thank you so much for this conversation. And to you viewers for joining us on Media Content C22, your local programming leader.